Dear friends, I am very pleased and honored to speak here today, and thank you very much for asking me to speak. My presentation is not the result of a well-researched academic paper, but it's the fruit of my soul searching and trying to make some sense out of being a human guinea pig. I am trying to explain logically something that defies logic because it deals with feelings. It deals with the innermost of my soul and many people cannot understand it. I am not a religious person. I am not an angel, nor am I a heroine. I am just a human being who survived many deadly experiments, who was treated as a subhuman, yet remained human, and who was been fortunate to discover the secret of self-empowerment and self-healing namely forgiveness. In 1944, I was merely a disposable human subject. If I would have died, I would have been replaced by twins arriving on the next transport. I hope you grasp the importance of this event, my speaking to you here. A disposable human guinea pig from Auschwitz who could not be disposed of by the Nazi doctors, is here to speak to you, the doctors, the scientists of today, about ethics in medicine. As I look around this room, I realize that I am in the company of many distinguished academic experts in the field of medicine, law, human behavior, medical research, and ethics in medicine. I also realize that you have asked me to speak to you today, not because of my great academic credentials, but because you want to know how does it feel to be a human guinea pig used and abused in human experimentation. I applaud your efforts. This is the most appropriate tribute to the memory of those who died, including my twin sister, Miriam Moses Zeiger. My speech is divided in three parts. One, how I survived Auschwitz. Two, how does it feel to be a human guinea pig and the lessons for ethics today. Three, self-liberation and self-healing through forgiveness. In May of 1944, we, the Moses family, my father, Alexander Moses, age 44, my mother, Jaffa Moses, age 38, my older sister, Edith Moses, age 14, my middle sister, Alice Moses, age 12, and Miriam and Eva Moses, identical twins, we were 10. We were loaded onto a cattle car. We came from a tiny village of 100 families called Ports in Transylvania, Romania. In 1940, our village was occupied by the Hungarian army. So we were part of the Hungarian transport that was sent to the Auschwitz death camp. It was the dawn of an early spring day in 1944. Our cattle car train came to a sudden stop. I could hear a lot of German voices yelling orders outside. We were packed like sardines in the cattle car, and above the press of bodies, I could see nothing. But there was a little patch of gray sky in the barbed wires in the window. As soon as we stepped down onto a cement platform, my mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand, hoping that as long as she could hold on to us, that she would be able to protect us. I was standing on that cement platform for maybe 10 minutes, when in my childish curiosity, I looked around trying to figure out what that place was. Suddenly, I realized that my father and two older sisters were gone. I never saw them again. 
As Miriam and I were clutching my mother's hand, an SS trooper hurried by, shouting, Twillinge, Twillinge, twins, twins. He stopped to look at Miriam and me because we were dressed alike and we looked very much alike. Are they twins, he asked. Is that good, asked my mother. Yes, nodded the SS. Yes, they are twins, said my mother. Without any warning or explanation, he grabbed Miriam and me away from our mother. Our screaming and pleading fell on deaf ears. I remember looking back and seeing my mother's arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never said goodbye to her, and I did not know then that this would be the last time that we saw her. This was just 30 minutes from the time we stepped down from the cattle car onto that selection platform, and we were ripped apart from our family forever. I will never forget that little strip of cement called the selection platform. It measures 85 by 35 feet, a strip of land where millions of people were ripped apart from their families forever. I believe that there is no other strip of land like that anywhere in the world. We became part of a group of little girls, all twins, 13 sets of little girls, age two to age 16. And one mother was permitted to stay with her seven-year-old daughters. We were marched to a huge building and made to sit naked for the better part of the day. Late in the afternoon, our processing began. We were given short haircuts. The mother's head was shaved. Our clothes were returned with a huge red oil-painted cross on the back because we were identified as human subjects for experiments. To have our own hair and our own clothes was a privilege that we, the twins, were granted. Then we lined up for registration and tattooing. When my turn came, I decided to give them as much trouble as I possibly could. <laughs> Four people, two Nazis and two women prisoners, restrained me with all their strengths while they heated a pen-like gadget over the flame of a lamp. And when it got really hot, they dipped it into ink, and then they burned into my left arm, dot by dot, the capital letter A-7063. Miriam became capital A-7064. Auschwitz was the only Nazi camp that tattooed its inmates. Years later, Miriam told me that in addition to creating a general confusion, I beat the Nazi holding my arm. I don't remember biting anyone. <laughs> I must have blocked it out of my mind. After all, I was raised to be a nice girl. And nice girls and nice boys don't bite. To look back at my childhood is to remember my experiences as a human guinea pig in the Auschwitz-Birkenau laboratory of Dr. Joseph Mengele. To recount such painful memories is to relieve of horrors of human experimentation where people were used only as subjects to research. I envision the chimneys, the smell of the burning flesh, the medical injections, the endless blood taking, the tests, the dead bodies that were all around us, the hunger and the rats. Nothing that is close to human existence existed in that place. Nothing on the face of this earth can prepare anyone for a place like Auschwitz. At age 10, Miriam and I became part of a very special group of twins, children used as human guinea pigs. 1,500 sets of twins were used by Mengele in his experiments. That first night, when Miriam and I went to the latrine, 
there on the filthy floor were the scattered corpses of three children. This is when I realized that that could happen to Miriam and me unless I did something to prevent it. So I made a silent pledge that I will do whatever is within my power to make sure that Miriam and I shall not end up on that filthy latrine floor. In the barrack, we were children, girls, aged between two and 16, huddled in our filthy bunk beds, crawling with lice and rats. We were starved for food. We were starved for human kindness. And we were starved for the love of the mothers and fathers we once had. We had no rights, but we had a fierce determination to live one more day, to survive one more experiment. No one tried to minimize the risk to our lives, and no one showed us any respect or consideration. On the contrary, we knew we were there to be used as guinea pigs at the mercy of Dr. Mengele and the other Nazi doctors. We were used in a variety of experiments. Three times a week, we would walk to Auschwitz I, where we would be placed naked in a room for up to eight hours a day. Every part of my body was measured compared to charts and compared to my twin sister. These particular experiments were not dangerous, but they were very, very demeaning. And even in Auschwitz, I could not cope with the fact that I was treated like a nobody and nothing. The only way that I could cope with it is by blocking it out of my mind. Even at that young an age, we knew we had to submit to Dr. Mengele's experiments. We were reduced to the lowest form of human existence, just a mass of living, breathing cells. Our families were gone, our lives depended on being a cooperative mess of living cells. There was no escape from it. Our childhood was gone, snatched away by the Nazis. Our bodies were fodder for Mengele's experiments. All we had were our lives. And I concentrated all my efforts, all my talent, all my being on one single thing, survival. Three times a week, we were taken to another lab that I call the blood lab. They would tie both of my arms, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. Those were the deadly ones. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever effect I desperately tried to hide because the rumor was that anyone taken to the hospital never came back. On the next visit to the blood lab, the doctors measured my fever. They never examined me, and I was taken to the hospital, which was filled with people who looked more dead than alive. Next morning, Dr. Mengele and four other doctors came to see me. They never examined me, just looked at my fever chart, and Dr. Mengele said, laughing sarcastically, too bad, she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. I was all alone. The doctors I had did not want to save my life, they wanted me dead. Miriam was not with me and I missed her so very much. She was the only kind and loving person I could cuddle up with when I was hungry, cold, and ill, even though I was very sick and all alone. I refused to die and made a second silent pledge that I will do everything within my power to prove Dr. Mengele wrong, survive, and be reunited with Miriam. For the next two weeks, I was between life and death. I remember waking up on the barrack floor. I was crawling because I no longer could walk. And I was crawling to reach a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack. This barrack was not allocated any food nor water, 
nor medicine, since people were brought there to die. As I was crawling, I would fade in and out of consciousness, and I kept telling myself, I must survive, I must survive. After two weeks, my fever broke, and I immediately felt much better. It took me another three weeks before my fever chart showed normal, and I was released and reunited with Miriam. But the happiness of our reunion was short-lived. Miriam looked just like the living dead I left in the barrack. She was sick and lost her desire to fight for her own life. It was very easy to die in Auschwitz. Surviving was a full-time job. The will to live often made the difference between life and death. Next day, I volunteered to carry food from the kitchen to the barrack so I could organize, which in camp language meant stealing from the Nazis. And please forgive me, but I will always call it organizing. <laughs> I wanted to organize raw potatoes. As I, en there it As I entered the kitchen, I saw a long table with two sacks of potatoes underneath it. I hesitated for a moment because the rumor was that anyone caught stealing would be hanged. I finally conquered my fear and bent down. I could feel two small potatoes in my hand when somebody grabbed me by my head, pulled me up, and yelled into my face, it's not nice to steal. I almost burst into laughter because I expected to be dragged to the gallows and hanged. I just learned a very important lesson that as long as Mangala wanted us alive, no one dared harm us. Next day, I tried my organizing skills again, <laughs> and I became the happy owner of three raw potatoes. We boiled them at night after the supervisors went to sleep, and I became a very good organizer. We had potatoes three to four times a week. The steady diet of potatoes gave Miriam enough strength to fight for her own life. When I was in Auschwitz, I thought that the whole world was a big concentration camp. Children lose their point of reference very fast. One day in July of 19, or August of 1944, I saw an airplane fly over Auschwitz. It was flying very low. I could see the American flag on one of the wings. That gave me the realization that somebody was trying to free us. That knowledge reinforced my determination to live one more day. Also, it gave me hope, and hope in Auschwitz was in very short supply. The air raids and fighting by the Allied forces continued and increased until liberation. On January 27, 1945, just four days, before my 11th birthday, Auschwitz was liberated by the Soviet army. We were free. We were alive. We have triumphed over unbelievable evil. The glory of that day will be forever engraved in my heart, and the echoes from Auschwitz will always be part of my life. My silent pledge, that first night in the latrine, became a reality. And that was an unbelievable experience. Part two, I, Eva Moses Kaur, a survivor of Mengele's Auschwitz experiment, have learned that human rights and human experimentation is an issue that needs to be addressed and taught. Those of you who are physicians and research scientists are to be congratulated. You have chosen a wonderful and difficult profession. Wonderful because you can save human life, and difficult because you are walking a very narrow line. You have been trained 
to use good judgment and clear logic. But you cannot forget that you are dealing with human beings. The moment you forget and cross that narrow line, you're heading in the direction of the Joseph Mangalas. I hope that what was done to me will never happen to another human being. Those of you who do research must be compelled to obey the international law. Scientists should continue to do research and I have personally benefited from your research. My son, Dr. Alex Kaur, in 1987, was this diagnosed with an advanced case of testicular cancer that had metastasized in his lungs and lymph nodes. I am so grateful to medical research that found a cure for my son. I want to thank Dr. Lawrence Einhorn from Indiana University Medical Center for saving my son's life. I am personally aware both of the benefits and drawbacks. Medical science can benefit mankind, but it can also be greatly abused. The scientists must make a moral commitment never to violate a person's human right and human dignity. The research scientists must respect the wishes of their subject. Every time you, the scientists, are involved in human experimentation, you should put yourself in the place of your subject and see how you would feel. You should, the scientists of the world, must remember that research is done for the sake of mankind and not for the sake of science. You must never detach yourselves from the subject you serve. If you do not know what to do, just ask yourself a simple question. Would I want to be treated this way if I was one of the research subjects? And if the answer is no, then you are doing something wrong. I hope with all my heart that our sad stories will in some way impel the international community to devise the rules to govern human experimentation. The dignity of all human beings must be respected, preserved, and protected at all costs. Life without it is a mere existence. I experience such loss of dignity every day as a guinea pig in Mangala's lab. These same doctors have taken an oath to save human life, yet they violated it. From 1944, until 1995, for 51 years, I felt deep emotional pain. I was a victim who was angry with the world and who could not be really happy. I was physically liberated from Auschwitz on January 1945 by the Soviet army. I liberated myself from the emotional pain in January 1995, when I forgave the Nazis, and this is what happened. After liberation, Miriam and I were in refugee camps for about nine months. We arrived back to our village to find three crumbled pictures on a bedroom floor. And that was all that was left of my family. We were taken in by an aunt who lost her family, who married a guy who lost his family. We lived in communist Romania from 1945 until 1950. During that time, I learned that the communists had beautiful slogans, but freedom was still just a dream. We wanted to leave Romania for Israel, but they did not let us leave. For two years, we struggled to get our exit visa, and then the Romanian government took away all our land, property, and everything we had, permitting us to take only what we could wear. I wore three dresses and a winter coat in the middle of the summer. I stood in line for that coat for 20 hours, and I was not going to leave it behind. <laughs> in 1950, we arrived in Israel. After two years in an agricultural school, 
We were drafted into the Israeli army. Miriam studied and became a registered nurse. I stayed eight years in the engineering corps, reaching the rank of sergeant major. In 1960, I met and married an American tourist from Terre Haute, Indiana. He is also a Holocaust survivor who was liberated in Buchenwald by an American colonel from Terre Haute. So, I came from Tel Aviv to Terre Haute, Indiana. Quite a jump. <laughs> Miriam got married in 1957. In 1960, when she was expecting her first child, she developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotic. With a second pregnancy in 1963, her kidney infection got worse, and the doctors found out that Miriam's kidneys never grew larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. After her third pregnancy, her kidneys failed, and in 1987, I had two kidneys, one sister, so I donated my left kidney. We were a perfect match, but a year after the transplant, she developed cancerous polyps in her bladder. The only one among 2,000 transplantees at that hospital to develop such cancer. The doctors in Israel said if we could find our Auschwitz file, that would help them figure out why Miriam was the only one to develop such a cancer. What I, we never found out what was injected in our body. All the doctors could say that something that was injected in her body combined with the anti-rejection medication to create the cancer. I looked for our Auschwitz file, and I am still looking for them. But we never found them so far. Miriam died on June 6, 1993. I came home from an open house as a realtor on a Sunday afternoon. There was a message on my answering machine from my brother-in-law telling me that Miriam died. I immediately called Israel, telling my brother-in-law that I will catch the first flight to Israel. He told me not to bother since the funeral was in 10 hours. Israel is seven hours ahead, and there was no way that I could get there in time. I pleaded with him to wait for me. I told him I have never buried any member of my family. A simple human gesture. I wanted to touch her. I wanted to say goodbye to her. And I even wanted to say goodbye to my kidney. <laughs> but he said no. I was devastated trying to cope with the death of my only sister. Three weeks after Miriam's death, I received a telephone call from Dr. John Michalczyk, who said to me that he heard me speak at a conference about Nazi medicine, and he wanted me to come to lecture to some doctors. I said to him that I love to lecture to doctors, <laughs> and I do. He asked me why, and I explained that when I go to the doctor, they tell me that I'm too fat, I don't eat the right food, I don't exercise enough, and then I have to pay them. I would like to tell the good doctors what they do wrong, because in my opinion, doctors do plenty of things wrong too. And after I choose them out, I look forward to them paying me. <laughs> so Dr. Mihalchik said to me, Eva, when you come to Boston, it would be really, really nice if you could bring with you a Nazi doctor. A Nazi doctor, I asked, stunned, where on earth do you think I can find one of those guys? <laughs> Last time I looked, they were not advertising in the yellow pages. <laughs> he insisted that I think about it, and I promised him that I would. I remember that the last project that Miriam and I worked on together in 1991, and we finished it in 1992, 
was a documentary on the Mengele twins done by TDF, a German television network. In the documentary appeared the Nazi doctor by the name of Dr. Hans Munch. He was not my doctor, but I figured he might be still alive, and I immediately faxed a letter to Germany, telling them that Miriam just died, and would they please give me Dr. Munch's telephone number in the memory of Miriam? And they did. Um, we contacted Dr. Munch and asked him to come to Boston, but he said that he could not come to Boston. Instead of that, he was willing to meet with me in Germany. So from that time on, I, the nightmares have ended, but now I had another nightmare. I was going to go and meet a Nazi doctor. In August of 1993, we arrived in Germany to meet this Nazi doctor. I was very, very nervous. What I remembered about Nazi doctors, I did not want to experience again. But I was also very curious what I might learn about our experiments. And why was this Nazi doctor willing to meet with me? We arrived at Dr. Munch's house, and he treated me with the utmost respect and kindness. It was overwhelming for me to be treated that kindly by a Nazi doctor. Unfortunately, he said he knew nothing about our experiments because Mengele always said it was top secret, and he never shared any of the details but he gave me a good interview for my Boston conference. I felt very much at ease in Dr. Munch's company. I realized that this might be one of the only times in my life that I could talk to the Nazi face to face. And um, I wanted to know if he knew anything about the gas chambers in Auschwitz, but this was a question that only popped in my mind at that moment. I have never ever thought about it before. So I asked him, Dr. Munch, do you know anything about the gas chambers? This is the nightmare I live with every single day of my life, was his answer. Then he went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. People would be told to remember their hangar number then they were taken into the shower room, which looked very good, even smelled good, because they spread a lot of perfume. Once the shower room was packed, the doors closed hermetically. Dr. Munch went outside. A vent-like hatch opened in the ceiling, in the roof. Zyklon B, which looked like pellets of white gravel and operated like dry ice. The container was opened and dropped from the roof and it fell to the floor. People were trying to get away from the rising gas and the strongest ones ended up on the top of the pile. When the people on the top of the pile stopped moving, Dr. Munch knew that everybody was dead. Then he would sign one certificate stating how many people were killed in the gas chamber. This was information I had never heard about it before. I immediately asked Dr. Munch to come with me to Auschwitz on January 1945. Then we would observe 50 years to the liberation of the camp. He immediately said that he would love to. I did not know that it was going to be that easy to convince him. Then I came home from Germany. I was very excited that I would have a document signed by a Nazi. I wanted to give him a gift as my way of thanking him, but I did not know how to thank a Nazi doctor. Where does one go to look for a gift for a Nazi? I didn't want to tell anybody about it because I was afraid that they would convince me not to do it. 
So I went to the local Hallmark shop, card shop, and I went to the section of thank you cards. I read many cards, but I found no card appropriate for a Nazi doctor. <laughs> so I went back to my life lesson number one. And my life lesson number one, when I give a lecture, a general topic lecture about survival and forgiveness, is never ever give up. For the next 10 months, I kept asking myself when I was cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry, or driving the car, when, when my mind wasn't too busy, how do I thank a Nazi doctor? What can I give this Nazi doctor? All kind of ideas popped into my mind until one day the following idea came to me, a simple letter of forgiveness from me to him. I knew he would like it, but what I discovered for myself was much more important. That I discovered that I had the power to forgive. No one could give me that power and no one could take it away. It was all mine to use it as I pleased. Victims are always hurt, angry, feel hopeless, feel helpless and feel powerless. I discovered that I had a power I didn't know before. I began writing my letter to Dr. Munch. I wrote many versions, working through a lot of pain, but I was concerned with my spelling in English, so I contacted my former English professor to correct my spelling. We met about three times, then she said to me one day, Eva, it's nice that you're forgiving Dr. Munch, but you really need to forgive Dr. Mengele. Your problem is with Dr. Mengele. I said that this was just a little letter for Dr. Munch. She asked me when I got home that night to promise her that I would think about forgiving Dr. Mengele. What she wanted me to do, if I could forgive, say that I forgive Dr. Mengele, how it would make me feel. I promised her that I would. Then I realized that I had the power to forgive even the angel of death. And I realized that I did have that power. I wasn't hurting anybody. So if I forgave Mangala, the worst of them, I might as well forgive everybody who has ever hurt me. It made me feel really good to have that power in my life. Up to now, I always reacted to what other people have done to me. Now, I was initiating action and I was not hurting anybody, so I had no reason not to do it. And it really made me feel good. We arrived in Auschwitz on January 27, 1995. Dr. Munch came with his daughter and son and granddaughter. I came with my son, Dr. Alex Kaur and Dr. Rina Kaur. Dr. Munch signed his document. I read mine and signed it. And immediately felt that all the burden of pain was lifted from my shoulder. I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz, nor was I a prisoner of my tragic past. I was finally free of Auschwitz and free of Mengele. Forgiveness is an act of self-healing and self-empowerment that brings serenity, freedom, and peace. Anger is a seed for war. Forgiveness is a seed for peace. I call forgiveness the modern miracle medicine. You don't need to belong to an HMO. <laughs> there is no copay. It will not bust your budget. So everybody can afford it because it's free. It has no side effects. It works. You do not need to fill out any informed consent form nor any compliance forms. <laughs> For those people who are unsure if they will miss their pain, if you don't like the way you feel free, you can always go and take your pain back. In 1984, I founded an organization called Candles. 
1995, I founded Kendall's Holocaust Museum and Education Center in Terre Haute, Indiana. I like the name because candles are used as a memorial and candles illuminate. Candles is an acronym for children of Auschwitz Nazi deadly lab experiment survivors. We wanted to shed some light on the darkest chapter of the Holocaust the chapter of the children used as human guinea pigs. Somebody said that the light of one single candle can illuminate the darkness of the entire universe. I am asking every single one of you to remember the Nuremberg Code, and as you leave my presentation, wherever life takes you, become a glowing light, an example of caring, and ethical behavior, and never use a human being in experiment without informed consent. I hope in some small way to send the world a message of hope, a message of healing, a message of forgiveness, and a message of peace. Thank you all, conference organizers, sponsors, and user participants. As I look at you, I can see a powerful beam of light going out of this room, spreading throughout the world to illuminate all the dark corners of human rights and human experimentation across the globe. Before I finish, I would like to share you one more thing. One of my life lessons that I share with other people is give your parents an extra hug and an extra kiss for all of us children who had no parents to hug and kiss. I would like to ask my son, Dr. Alex Kaur, who is here with me, to come up so he could give me a hug and a kiss. <laughs> <laughs>